If you've seen the unfinished Dali collaboration with Walt Disney, Destino, and wondered, how could a surrealist animated film work? Look no further than The King and the Mockingbird, directed by Paul Grimaud, one of France's foremost animators. Grimaud started his career in the early 30s, making experimental shorts, which led to him opening his own animation company, Les Jimwell. He began working with advertisers, but would go on to do much more. Then the war broke out, and most of the animators were drafted to Casablanca. When they returned, Les Jamour was the only animation production in occupied Europe, and with the American film ban, they controlled the market, a profitable outcome for the company. Furthermore, after making several unique shorts, a film Le Voya de Paramore won first prize at the 1946 Venice Film Festival for animation, a prize they'd win again two years later, with a loftier and more ambitious collaboration alongside screenplay and poet Jaco Prevert. With both critical and financial success, the pair would start to work on France's first full feature length animation, based on the fairy tale The Shepherdess and the Chimney Sweep. With a team made of 100 animators putting in three years to the film, until the money ran dry and the production problems seeped in, a fifth of the film was left unfinished. The producers decided to release it anyway, edited down against Grimmel and Prevert's wishes. The Curious Adventures of Mr. Bird was then released. I'm sure this all sounds familiar. The production was too ambitious. The company steps in and pulls it back, and in spite of its issues, it's remembered as a cult classic that inspired some of the big names along the way. This is where most stories of this nature end, but not Grimmel's. While Grimmel gave up his creative endeavors for a time, he would return, gaining the rights to his original film. But not just that, Grimmel would spend the next couple of years funding a production to finish the film as intended, while bringing back many of the original animators. So finally, in 1980, 28 years later than when it started production, King and the Mockingbird was released as intended. Now I find it hard not to admire someone that's so dedicated to their creative vision, but make no mistake, it would be easy to argue that the scenes added don't bring much to the overall film, just bloating it. This is the case of animation historian Fred Patton, but I'll argue that the content added complements the film's poetic structure and emphasizes its surrealist philosophy, solidifying its place in the movement. You might be asking, what makes King and the Mockingbird a surrealist cartoon over just a regular cartoon, being absurd? Well, if we're talking about surrealism, we need to define what that means. The manifesto defines itself as based on the belief in a superior reality of a certain form of previously neglected associations, in the omnipotence of dreams, in the disinterest play of thought. So it's encouraging a dreamlike state, which visually the film matches. The design of the castle has little rhyme or reason, not to mention the painted backdrops have an ethereal style with a lucid undertone. You can see the influence of Giorgio de Chirico, the surrealist painter. In fact, the film has a lot of influence from 30s and 40s pop culture that clash, as if they weren't supposed to be next to each other, as if it were a dream. Surrealist film aimed to reject the rational, contradicting the consciousness and negating the normal. Surrealists adopt a view of life that seeks to liberate the imagination. In this spirit, the opening of the film focuses on the bird character talking directly to the audience, telling them this story is true, perfectly true, which as an audience we know is not possible, but as surrealist filmmaker Clock Toe would say, a lie always tells the truth. In fact, the original English version takes this concept one step further and spells it out to the audience. I was told to say it, and I don't particularly want to get into trouble, but then, after all, what have I got to lose? <laughs> uh, this story is quite true. Uh, the truth, and nothing but the truth. Surrealist film wants to subvert film tropes, building an expectation, only to break it. Something Mockingbird repeats throughout. Falling police officer praying before he falls to his fire in the next scene. The bird that fell from a great height. Pit of lions which are flaccid and tame. Even with all that, surrealism is not incapable of being rational, and this film does have an overarching narrative. Mockingbird is based off the Hans C. Anderson story, The Shepherdess and the Chimney Sweep, involving figurines of said characters falling in love and being told they couldn't be together because of the way they were made. 
In the film version, these characters were changed from figurines to paintings, so the dynamic of the tale has changed. In the night, dreams become reality, paintings become living, and what in itself is a moving painting. Focusing on this change shows the bringing of an art form to life, in this case, surrealism. But if you think that's a jump, let's look into it further. Surrealism looks for the point of contact, conjunction between different realms. The paintings leave their frames to escape together into the night, into a physical world where they are stopped by an old statue who thinks they shouldn't be together. In the same way as in the original fairy tale, the devil is in the details. Out of the pieces of art that come to life, the statue is the first to do so. He discovers the paintings. This is similar to a certain surrealist film called Blood of a Poet. The sculpture comes to life to show a man the way into dreams, through a mirror that leads to a ball of water. In contrast, the king's painting steals the sculpture's horse and jumps into a painting that happens to have a pool of water. The original Hans C. Anderson tale didn't involve a king, and this is one of the defining changes to the character of the film. The king, an arrogant, violent, pompous, short, cross-eyed ruler. His story is similar to another of Anderson's, The Emperor's New Clothes. In one scene, as the king is painted, the artist brings attention to the king, his lazy eye. The reality crushes the king's dreamlike perception. He disposes the artist, then changes the painting to keep his ideal self alive. And this idea gains life beyond himself and ends up usurping the original king, replacing the imperfect man with a caricature of himself. His hubris was his downfall, with the irony being, after being built up over the last 25 minutes, he was removed by his own lover and by himself. It's one of the many examples of bathos throughout the film. It's hard not to ignore the context that there are several similarities between Hitler and the king, not just in appearance or the contempt of the people, but in his words, work frees the people. On the other hand, there were rumors that the design of the king was inspired when Grimmelt took a trip to California where he saw young Richard Nixon posters for a local election to which Hall thought to himself, that man looks like the perfect villain and grabbed as many references as he could before coming back to France. Well, just hearsay, there is enough similarities for it to hold water. Now, why bring up these real life figures if this is just about surrealist philosophy? Well, surrealism would condemn that which puts artistic accomplishment and aestheticism before revolutionary spirit and thought. The painter scene was added to the film to build up this idea of satire around the legacy of a leader overshadowing the real person and the dangers that comes with that. The next big character added to the film has the most motive, the bird. He is first the narrator and guide to the film, someone who pushes the plot forward, a deus ex machina at times, when needed, uh, who despises the king for killing his wife and kidnapping his young. Although he spends most of his time giving absurdist speeches to the couple or helping them escape. The film may be named after him, but his role isn't the focus. The couple are, and they are as thin as the canvas they were painted on fairy tale to a fault. I believe this was somewhat intentional. Jacqueline Prevert was a screenwriter known for his involvement in the early surrealist movement and as a founder of poetic realism. I think he wrote the script with the idea to subvert those kind of adaptations of fairy tales. It seems both Prevert and Grimault were more interested in building a world to comment on and the narrative around the king's downfall than putting a love story on a pedestal. This can be seen in the two endings to the film. The original 1952 version focuses on the couple's marriage and the happily ever after, while the extended version of The King and the Mockingbird is much more in line with the revolutionary spirit and is more ambiguous. While some of the newer scenes may not be needed overall, the changes are closer to the euphorial intent and philosophy of the movement and I don't see why Grimoire would spend 30 years to finish it if these ideals were not important to him. Pushing the medium forward as a whole into a more thoughtful direction and inspiring people along the way. A French film critic once said, Grimoire's films are neither philosophical theses nor revolutionary experiments, but he is the only cartoonist who can compare with René in his deep feeling of reality. And I agree, he was neither, but actually both. He had a way of balancing these concepts in a way that you may not even see. The King and the Mockingbird is woefully unappreciated. Even outside its message, it has great animation, backdrops, and it's a unique final product, if a bit aged. 
While the original version is in the public domain, the quality leaves something to be desired. The remastered versions are available online in both Blu-ray and DVD formats, though lacking some of the special features. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.